So, uh, this topic is a very big topic uh, framed within the Shambhala teachings. Very familiar to those of you who have taken any um, Shambhala training uh, classes or weekend workshops. And um, we just had one here in New York that I co-taught with my son Ethan, uh, Shambhala Training Level 1, which was, um, we actually, for the first time, had to turn people away. That was quite an amazing moment there uh, for, the, for the weekend. We were just kind of bursting at the seams there. So, for those of you who don't know, the Shambhala teachings as they exist currently in the West, were um, brought out by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. And uh, pr probably many of you have seen the book Shambhala, The Sacred Path of the Warrior. And his son, Sakyang Mipan Rinpoche, is the second lineage holder and following on with those teachings uh, as we go here. So, <clears throat> Shambhala teachings, um, sort of from a mythic point of view, track back all the way to the time of the Buddha. And the uh, sort of story is there was a king of Shambhala um, who requested to have the Buddha come and teach. And the teachings that he requested were for his, the people living in his kingdom at the time, and for them to be able to access the contemplative practices and uh, sort of a view that would enable them to continue to practice but remain uh, sort of embedded in their secular lifestyle. And of course the famous uh, um, line that Trungpa Rinpoche used to say is that then uh, the, according to the legend that uh, Buddha asked the monks and nuns in his retinue to leave uh, so they wouldn't hear the teachings that he gave to the Shambhalians because they were sort of a different, had a different slant to them than the renunciate teachings. Uh, in essence, I think it would not be at all unfair to say that um, the Shambhala teachings and the practices are utterly intertwined with the Buddhist dharmas and teachings. And um, so that we... Uh, can see easily that the practices themselves, in terms of the meditation practice being central, uh, are, are uh, similar. And if you looked in terms of really framing the Shambhala teachings, it would not be inaccurate to say that they are tantric or Vajrayana teachings uh, linked with a very strong sort of Mahayana society kind of uh, message. So if you understand the third turning of the wheel of the Buddha Dharma, uh, the notion is that um, there's a proclamation or a kind of positive statement made at the beginning of the fruition of the entire path, which is the notion of um, that we already have the resources and the kind of qualities inherent within us that we are seeking to cultivate in the path. They're, they don't need to be imported from somewhere else. So, of course, in the Buddhist terms, uh, this is called Buddha nature, and sometimes Bodhicitta, which are, you know, considered to be of essence of sentient beings like ourselves, um, which can be covered over, you could say, um, by all kinds of habitual patterns and confusion and uh, clashes, as we'd say in the Buddhist <coughs> word, or neurotic patterns, and um, can be uncovered uh, to kind of shine uh, uh, and, and our, have, have our most uh, um, brilliant and most virtuous qualities, you know, kind of shine through. So the notion in <clears throat> those style of teachings is that they, you could say the path or the, the, the ground is already considered to be uh, fully ripened by nature. And uh, so in the Shambhala teachings, the way that we talk about this is we say there's um, that beings, you know, sentient beings, and particularly human beings in this case, since that's who we're talking to, in case there's um, any of other little creatures floating around or uh, running around your apartment, they could listen to if they want to. But these teachings are very specifically for human beings. 
and that human beings possess something called basic goodness. So the basic goodness is, an, I think, an attempt to say in our own language, you know, those words originate in English. They're not, um, there are corollaries in, in Tibetan, but in essence, uh, basic goodness is um, telling us something about who we are and where we're starting from. Where are we starting from? So, you know, we talked about it Friday, and some of you were there, I see, of the people sort of signing in. Um, and I see some questions coming up already, and I'll, I'll probably hold some of those. Uh, so there's some good questions already, and I'll hold those for, for as we go, go along. So again, if you're just joining us now, you can um, put your texts and comments and questions in by uh, opening up a second window on facebook.com slash David Nickturn and you'll see the scroll there and you can just uh, uh, type in there. So before we get to any specific questions, I'd like to give some idea and uh, I think even if you were with us over the weekend, it's still worth uh, continuing to look at um, the notion of basic goodness. What exactly does that mean? And um, what's interesting about it is the statement you could say if you're making a statement is that human beings are basically good. So, of course, that might seem naive or, or, or uh, simplistic. Some of the best truths do appear naive and simplistic. Um, like you reap what you sow, things like that. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, a stitch in time saves nine while we're at it. That's a good one. Literally provable. <clears throat> if you have any socks, you can prove that particular one. So the idea is that um, we have some kind of fundamental quality that's indestructible. In Buddhism, we were talking about it like Vajra-like or indestructible. And not based on causes and conditions. That's what basic means. Sometimes it's called unconditional basic goodness in the full full expression of it. So that's a powerful thing that you say something is not based on causes and conditions because pretty much everything that we are involved with seems to be conditional. Um, you know, if you looked at your hair and your glasses and your fingers, all changing all the time, um, the cause and conditions of this body that we have are clearly that our two parents came together in a certain way and uh, without that event happening I'm not sitting here and you're not sitting there so now we're talking about something that's not like that that's not based on the cause and conditions uh, being right uh, it's the fundamental nature the Buddha nature the basic goodness so we're going to look at that unconditionality partly. And then the second quality that's ascribed to basic goodness is that it has uh, uh, all kinds of expressions, some kind of fundamental quality that expresses itself a number of different ways. All of them, by our sort of standard practices, very positive, very virtuous, um, leaning towards, you know, um, benefiting oneself and others in genuine ways, leaning towards authenticity, uh, leaning towards um, appreciating the richness and um, details of our of our existence in so many different ways. So the, uh, the relative aspect of basic goodness is also something that <clears throat> I described this weekend as just that kind of feeling that you have when you want to give a child a cookie. You know, I mean, you can make it as complex as, as you want, but the fact is the simple moments of love and caring that happen during a day, and I would say, as as uh, Dorje Dradal Trungpa Rinpoche used to say, when something touches our heart, you know, and sometimes when we're doing practice, I, I say to people, why don't you go ahead and touch your heart, uh, because so much of our activity seems to center around our head and kind of our conceptual mind that just dropping your awareness down into the heart. <clears throat> and you know, 
it comes up into your throat then too because if something touches your heart then your throat um, you have sometimes trouble speaking and then sometimes it goes back up into your head because you, you didn't feel like crying so these feelings that uh, we have where we let the world touch us in a sympathetic way are considered to be very close to our actual essence when that's happening there's not much that we can do to stop it from happening other than shutting down <laughs> In other words, we're saying this is more natural, this kind of compassion, this kind of empathy, this kind of clarity of, of present awareness. These are the natural things. And the rest of it is kind of fabricated or brought about by various causes and conditions. So in a way, it's sort of turning the, the whole thing upside down, how we normally think that uh, kind of things are messed up and we have to fix them. Right? Isn't that how we normally, how we normally go about it? we say, oh, you know, this is such a mess, I'm a mess, uh, but if I worked hard enough, I could fix it, clean it up. What the basic goodness teachings are saying is you're not a mess, actually. Uh, you're basically good, we're basically good, but anyhow, you could have some kind of uh, cover-up going on, some kind of obstacles. So it's very optimistic, it's very positive. Um, and one analogy we could use that I like, there are several good analogies, let's try a couple for basic goodness. One is uh, like silver. So probably most of you have some kind of silver. You, <laughs> If you're younger, you inherited it from your parents. Um, it's not so common that people buy a good set of silver, but you've played with silver, you've seen it. And the silver tends, at least in the old households, it tended to get put away in these kind of velvet boxes, you know, and, taken out for, for nice, beautiful feasts and dinners and things. And then you look at the silver and it's going, oh my goodness, this, is, this can't possibly be the silver I put into the box <clears throat> because it's all covered with tarnish and junk. So, uh, gunk, I mean, sorry. And then you get out this very smelly paste called silver polish and you rub on it and amazingly the tarnish part comes off on the cloth and the silver starts to shine and becomes quite luminous and beautiful. So this is like basic goodness. We didn't really create the silver. The silver was underlying there. And um, we're just simply removing uh, that which obstructs the um, direct perception of its true quality. So, <clears throat> similarly, the sun is sometimes used as an analogy for basic goodness because it's sort of shining primordially. We even talk about the great eastern sun in Shambhala. It's shining in a way that is kind of like you don't change the batteries in the sun and you don't have to plug it in. <clears throat> it's sort of free of that kind of level of uh, you know effort and um, you know even if you just rolled over there's the sun and you you know you don't have to hold it up in the sky and you don't have to really um, pray for it to stay there. It's even free of that kind of approach. And the sun is has some qualities that are very analogous to basic goodness, like brilliance, luminosity, and uh, also it's kind of very direct and very much in front of you and very straightforward. Um, kind of unavoidable in a way, has that quality. Um, and it's also vast, you know, compared to just like, like if we set up lights in a photo studio, you, you, you need to do a lot of effort and you put all these bulbs together, but if it was a sunny day, it would be like, the whole, not only the whole room is filled with light, but the whole uh, neighborhood is filled with light, the whole city is filled with light. And you can get some idea of the power of the sun when you uh, don't live someplace where there is electric lights like if you're out in retreat or in the country or something like that. Um, but even in the city, you get this feeling, this kind of dull glow from the city that never stops. But when the sun comes up, it's just thousands of times more bright than any human light. So in this way, the primordial quality is, is represented. The luminous or light quality is represented. And the kind of vast quality of it is, is you know, sort of transcending, you know, petty pettiness and petty mind is the metaphoric part. 
Now, the sun, in terms of our experience, our experience of the silver can be like, wow, it's dirty, messy, a gunky thing until we clean off the tarnish. And similarly, when we have weather, you know, the, we can have a day in which we say, oh, the weather, I hate, we are having bad weather today, which is a very humanocentric point of view. From the weather's point of view, it's neither bad nor good. Um, but from our point of view, we go, oh, it's raining, so this is going to make it more difficult for me. But if we were really anxious people, we would say, oh, the sun's never going to come out again. Um, and, you know, we have a certain amount of panic about it. But we know that basically that's going to be impermanent and the clouds are going to pass and we have that bright sunshine again. So our relationship to the sun is uh, temporary, you know, on and off. But the sun itself, just like basic goodness, is basically just on. So that's a very powerful point of view. Excuse me, to, to um, say that our nature has that kind of quality to it. And of course, it's worth uh, it's worth exploring. And the way that we explore this this uh, premise of basic goodness is that we uh, test it or mix it with our own experience. And um, the best way we do that is in, in in practicing meditation. But you can also do it just right now. So you look at your own nature. You look at your own experience. And you look at the quality of it that's kind of um, manufactured, you want to say, you know, that, that we kind of create and so forth. And then there's a quality of just relaxing into the nature uh, of the natural mind, the natural heart. And the only way we can really do that is by doing nothing. Um, which is interesting, if you try too hard to do it, of course then you're creating some kind of situation in which you're manufacturing some kind of goodness. And it becomes quite superficial and it, it's flimsy. Uh, if, you know, the, for example, if somebody's trying so hard to be good in the conventional sense of the word, um, and then you get their goat, you hit their buttons, they're gone, and they're not being so good anymore. They might be quite irritable and upset. So the kind of basic goodness that we're talking about isn't really based on, uh, you know, superficial conduct or, uh, or circumstances turning out how you like them, things going well, things not going well. Um, so I hope that's that's clear that the notion of basic goodness is is beyond all that. Um, it's referring to some kind of workability and some kind of brilliance and lusciousness of our existence that doesn't need to be pumped up. And we can access by cutting through, penetrating, a haze, you know, a cloudy haze, or you could say a tarnished uh, kind of um, gunky mental overlay. We have to penetrate through that, and, and that's where the meditation practice can help. We can do it on the spot. We don't really need to make such a big deal about it. Um, and the way you do it on the spot is just by kind of, uh, you could say, uh, recognizing the spontaneous quality of nowness. That no matter what we do, we can't really destroy nowness. And it's ind indelibly linked to the idea of basic goodness. It's the idea of nowness. Sometimes in Shambhala we call it a dot, you know, or a... a, a, a um, this exact moment, you know, and just allow people to kind of notice that. Even on in cyberspace, you can. Even though it's a very seductive environment for like getting lost, um, still we're trying to use it in a way here to go. Even as we're talking virtually through all this kind of technology, still this quality is present, and still you can access it by leaving a little bit of space for your mind to just mix with the extreme nowness of what we're doing right here. So the meditation is really about cultivating your relationship to basic goodness or recognizing it as existent in, in, a, in a certain way uh, by allowing and nudging yourself to be in the moment. You have to allow by relaxing and nudge by cutting through 
all the other stuff, all the tarnish and all the cloudy mind. And you get that combination going of cutting through and then relaxing. And that's, that's really what our meditation practice is at all the different levels of it. You cut and then you uh, feel some effortless quality. And you rest. So, um, basic goodness, you know, this is the um, legacy of, of Trungpa Rinpoche, to talk this way. And now, uh, you know, the current lineage holder, Sakyong Mipam, is emphasizing this so much, just to, even in the midst of what are very subtle and sophisticated teachings on the qualities of the mind, and the Buddhist legacy is so deep and so rich, even within that sort of array of teachings that could be presented, uh, Sakyong Mipam now is just powerfully just drilling this idea across of we're basically good. And uh, this is where a very interesting thing came up at our weekend on Friday night, where, um, and it's a funny th thing I've seen before, where people get actually upset <laughs> or offended by this idea that people are basically good. Even though we ask, well, how many of you really believe that or think that's true in some way? However you, however you, however you think of it. Are pe people basically bad? Are they sort of bad and good mixed in and you've got to work very hard on the good because otherwise the bad's going to take over? Are some people evil and irretrievable, unredeemable? So one of the people I think got up and sort of said, she doesn't want to apply this to everybody because she thinks some people basically are mean, evil, and I guess unredeemable. Um, so from that point of view, the basic goodness is um, not so basic in that case for that person, sort of relative. <clears throat> but when you meet, it's interesting to me when I met my great, the great masters and teachers that really embody this quality, they seem to see it in everybody else. And it makes, you know, <laughs> you have to see that. You know, at some point people have to see somebody who embodies basic goodness. And uh, that's supposedly the quality of the lineage is that it's an embodiment that's transmitted from person to person where you see what it looks like when somebody has some confidence and trust in that quality. And so they can see it in themselves and they can see it in others. Um, and it raises the confidence level. So I mentioned over the weekend the great Kensei, Dilgo Kensei Rinpoche, who um, brought out the best in everybody without doing it anything, just by glowing. And there are other great teachers, you know, you all know that sometimes I play with Krishnadas and his, his guru, Neem Karoli Baba, seemed to have that same quality of just making people recognize their basic goodness on the spot. Maharaji. So, and then there's different ways, you know, to touch in with that. And so the, uh, the kirtan people, uh, you know, chant to touch in on that heart center quality, that sort of primordial goodness. Um, and many people have different ways of, of um, working with it and also working with the obscurations, purifying them to experiencing that. <clears throat> So I hope this uh, is making some sense. It's um, a very, it's it's not supposed to be like uh, a nursery rhyme exactly, but if you listen to those nursery rhymes, you know some of them are really really um, joyful and profound. So that quality does have a simplicity, joyful and profound, but it's not so much like that. We don't have to create some effort and some put give our attention and and mix it with our experience, you know. Uh, to, to really realize the fruit, you know, like you could have a, a, a bunch of oranges in your refrigerator, but if you don't squeeze them, you're not going to have a orange juice in the morning. So we could have some recognition of this, but we have to really make it personal and rouse our own energy and conviction and experience. So I'd like to just see if any of you have any questions at this point. We can go on and sort of create a dialogue. Last week that was amazing and uh, kind of really food for thought that um, we're actually talking this way and I mentioned that I think we'll have the technology within a year or two at the most where I'll be able to see you there is that technology now you know for multiple uh, multiple connections to happen um, 
but in this case um, I can still read your comments and what I'll do is I'll take some of them and read them out loud uh, and and who and if you could when you write in if you could um, you know say where you're from too so okay Judy hi Judy um, Judy worth Friedsome uh, is writing in and I'll, I'll repeat the question. You might be able to see it in the scroll, but let me read it for the people who can't. Um, how does one view all sentient beings as having basic goodness? How does one hang on to that sometimes illusional vision or concept when we read the newspapers? This is exactly what came up in the weekend. Or watch the news on TV and see all the violence that occurs nationwide. I often struggle with the concept that basic goodness based on all the violence one sees is naturally inherent in all of us. Your thoughts? Well, frankly, I'm just going to get a little water here. If we're not ready for that question, we're not ready to talk about or study or teach Shambhala teachings because otherwise it's just a kind of naive, um, you know, um, Pollyanna uh, utopian thing. And then the minute somebody even you know, uh, punched somebody else. It's over. You know, Shambhala just was over. So, how do we deal uh, with the chaos and confusion in the world around us? And what was interesting this weekend is when Ethan said it's sort of confusion as opposed to evil, I think that's a very powerful notion. And we talked about it quite a lot afterwards because that's the, the point that the woman took exception to. But as we talked about it later, we said confusion, that we're, the kind of confusion we're talking about, can be utterly pernicious and totally damaging and destructive, uh, up to whatever level you want to go in terms of creating harm. So um, looking at that, Judy, um, if, if it helps you to think that the, the obscurations that we have or the habits that we've developed over time developed by causes and conditions that um, you know are essentially the unfolding of our karma in relation to our world uh, that the confusion can become deeply entrenched utterly powerful and completely obscure the quality of basic goodness so much so that you could have a dark time I mean supposedly for example we're living in what's called the Kali Yuga the dark ages from a spiritual point of view, many people have this view that we're in a very materialistic, dark, uh, and getting worse time because the basic goodness is obscured, is not pointed out, is not cultivated. And it comes from a certain kind of um, convergence of conditions in which you, know, you could say the forces of ign ignorance and aggression are very, very strong. So all you have to do to answer your own question, I think, Judy, and maybe you can write back in after we say this, is look at your own self when you're behaving badly. And then answer, does that mean I'm myself, I'm basically bad? Let's forget about other people for a second. And look at yourself like if you're yelling at your child and you lose your temper, um, or if you, um, you know, stub your toe on the door and smash your fist through the door as if the door, it was the door's fault. Have you ever done that? Or if you um, lose faith, you know, in um, love because you've had a heartbreak. Does that mean that you yourself still do not possess basic goodness? If we cannot find it in ourselves, in our own hearts, there's no way to go, uh, to go at the societal level. It can't happen. But what we are saying is that on top of this basic goodness is an overlay <clears throat> of powerful confusion and obscuration based on causes and condition, based on habitual patterns, but that it's not permanent and intrinsic. So you have to ask yourself that question, and I'd love to hear back from anybody else who wants to take a shot at it. This is the $64 question. When somebody asked the question on Friday night, I said, really good, good question. That's the $64 question. So let me see what else some of us are saying. Um, and. Um, Who is online with us now? We have quite a few people at this point. Ah, hey Marzia from Rome. 
you're up late again. It's it's uh, probably two thirty or one thirty or two thirty in Rome. So um, great to see you. You're very brave to be joining us and much appreciated. And so we're going to go out and have some pasta tonight after we finish this, so we can celebrate. Um, and let's see who else is around. Joel, uh, hi Jello, how are you? Nice to see you. I gave her a little nickname by rearranging the letters of her name. Karen is still in Brooklyn. Um, Yvonne, hello, greetings back to you. Um, so let's see what other questions. Okay, uh, Karen is saying, I find this a surprisingly difficult concept to come to grips with. You bet your boots, Bob. Um, because if it was easy, uh, things wouldn't look exactly the way they do right now. I can imagine the basic goodness is a feeling of lightness, perhaps even joy, but is that it? Is morality or value something linked to this? I think there's so many ways to talk about this, and some are a little more abstract and some are a little more experiential. When Trungpa Rinpoche used to talk about basic goodness, he often made really sure to connect it to experience. So um, he would talk about you know the qualities of being able to perceive the world. We have everything we need to connect with our world. Um, we have um, you know these fantastically sophisticated eyes that uh, intersect with an astonishingly astonishingly vivid world, we can disc discriminate red from blue. And when you really open the gateway to the sense perceptions, this is a way to experience <clears throat> one aspect of basic goodness. When you have some kind of sharp reminder that it's actually now, not, not just something people write books about, but actually they're right, it is now, and we are being here now, and it is powerful, and when you yourself personally have some reminder of that, I, I gave the analogy over the weekend of a th uh, thunderstorm and that I experienced out in Long Island where l we had to pull over the side of the road because the road was unpassable when the port force of the rain and the thunder and the lightning struck about every two seconds for one hour. Never ever seen that before. Don't know if I'll ever see that since. Not completely sure I really saw it <laughs> because it was so shocking. But the vivid quality of nowness was made apparent because it was made unavoidable. Normally we think we have a choice. We could be thinking about the past or the future and dwelling in certain ways. So through the sense perceptions, the vivid power of nowness, which is something that can be pointed to and brought out in a situation um, and wakes us up, the other is by literally, and I mean this physically, to feel one's own heart center. And in like, for example, in the Maitri meditation that we did, the loving kindness meditation, you can allow something that actually forces you to feel the sense of connectivity and tenderness in your heart by just thinking about somebody you love. So if, if you want to, Karen, that's, a, without qualifying it any further, Think about the immediacy and vividness of, of, of now experience, the momentary experience, and the kind of tenderness or soft-heartedness that we have when everything else is stripped away. Like if we lose somebody we love and we have no defenses left. There's no way to ward it off or to manipulate the experience at all. So these are the ways of tapping into basic goodness uh, and, and sort of seeing it at the, at the root or the kind of accessible always accessible but sometimes covered over. So maybe uh, Karen write back in uh, with, with thoughts on that and uh, Judy maybe you could write back in with thoughts on what we said and let me just see if there's any um, new questions coming in. Okay. Uh, Harvey, hello. He says hello everyone, what a nice idea. Well, that's good. That's encouraging. It's uh, it's kind of us going digital here, but still trying to do some dharma together. So now, uh, Lynn Louise Wonders is writing in from Atlanta. Hello. 
Ah, okay. Let me jump to Joel's Jello's question. Uh, he's in Cleveland. I'll, I'll be there. Um, I think I told you, Jello, that I'm going to come to Cleveland and see you that weekend. So for anybody else in the Cleveland area, I'm going to be there, um, I think, I think last weekend in March or something like that. It'll be on the calendar on the website. Um, one of my great thrills is actually meeting you people after talking to you online. I love it. And some of you have been coming to the workshops and so forth. So uh, Joel says, Jello says, what seems truly difficult is how to get... The, get someone who doesn't see their basic goodness to believe they are good. Well, to be honest, I would stop trying. And uh, <laughs> why do you need them to do that? <laughs> you want them to do it. I understand why you want them to do it, but why do you need them to do it? If you see the basic goodness, that's enough. That's actually sufficient. So, um, we really, and this is why in, in our tradition, we really stop short of going all the way out to try to manipulate other people's experience. And a lot of it is, uh, there's two ways really, maybe three, that we can teach. And one is by presenting the theory of it, which is kind of what we're starting with tonight. That's a good way to at least start. Another is by actually uh, modeling the, what's being talked about oneself and that is absolutely the best so as I say like when people would meet Ken Rinpoche they really didn't need to have a talk on basic goodness it, it just went right in kaboom right into where it is and it was unbelievable or his holiness Karmapa you know used to go walking down the street and people would just come up to him and they could feel this quality and they just start smiling so it's kind of um, a radiance that we're talking about. So I would say our interest in terms of this um, jello is to radiate out, to touch in and then radiate out. There's a lot of good practices in Shambhala to help us do that as, as you go along. Um, so the idea of getting someone to do something, um, I would say you want to invite and you want to inspire and you don't want to get anything, anybody to do anything because they're figuring it out themselves, you know? So in the natural process of sharing space and communication and sharing heart, everything will, will get illuminated. I, I believe that. So then, uh, okay, J Janet. Hi, Janet. Nice to see you after the weekend. Um, I remember exactly who you are and where you were sitting. And... Um, Janet is saying, I shared basic goodness info with my work team today. This is right after Shambhala training weekend. We're having issues, issues with our new supervisor. <laughs> I told my team that we've been playing smooth jazz for the 10 years we have been together. And our new supervisor comes in and wants us to play Sousa marches. <laughs> We need to find the joy in Susa and keep our eyes on the larger issue, our job in helping the people of New Jersey. Honestly, that's almost like a poem, Janet. Even if none of that was true, that is just like beautiful prose. <laughs> the people of New Jersey. All the, pe all the people of New Jersey, I hope. Um, the people we like, the people we don't care about, and the people we don't like in New Jersey. So that's quite a poetic thing. I'll have to try to extrapolate what you mean by Sousa because Sousa is pretty rousing. I think of it as like pretty cheerful music, not at all like grating. Or, um, it sounds like it's a little bit different quality, but I guess I don't get yet what the um, issues would be or what the problem is other than shifting. It sounds like two positive gears to me. So maybe, Janet, can you write back and say what's, what's negative about it? What's the troubling part of it? And... Um, uh, how maybe um, there's some friction there because we have an easy access to basic goodness when we're having a good time you know I mean you don't have to like give a lecture on basic goodness at a summer picnic it's only when the red ants come and eat the food and, and, and it's only when the rain, a thunderstorm comes up that you have to talk about it. But when people are happy, that's already happening. So 
really what we want to look at is how we can work with obstacles and obstructions in a way that we don't lose track of the basic goodness. We don't lose our, our uh, contact with it. Um, and we still feel um, some connection with that. Okay, so let's see if anybody else. So please follow up on these questions. That's, of course, where it gets fun is the question after the, after the original question. And let me just uh, come up with people are writing in pretty actively now. So let's just chat for a while. We've still got a little time. Um, oh, okay, Janet, you wrote back. Um, okay, everybody wrote back. How cool. Okay. And I just have to say, Anna, where are you? You said since everyone's saying hi, you're saying hi. Um, are you down down there or are you up here in, in the New York area? I don't know. Um, but anyhow, great to hear from you. And um, I'm sure I'll see you before, before too long. So, um, hi, Anna. So... Uh, Janet, uh, let's start with you and then a couple other people have followed up. Even the ones at the Jersey Shore. <laughs> that could be your poem. Even the people at the Jersey Shore have basic goodness and you have to write more lines after that. Um, salsa is in your face. Oh, okay. Very poetic. Very cool. Yeah, I see. It's more forward. Um, I still say it's rousing though and cheerful if it's in your face. So, I, not not salsa. I'm sorry. Not, I keep mixing with salsa. Sousa. Yeah, John Philip Sousa is what you mean. Marching band. So this person's trying to get everybody up and marching. And unfortunately, our supervisor wants to change things up, and she thinks that she is wonderful, and the rest of us are dirt and don't know anything. <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay, Janet. I'm glad you're able to uh, bring bring your comments down to earth in that way. Um, I'll read it again. Unfortunately, our supervisor wants to change things up, and she thinks she is wonderful, and the rest of us are dirt and don't know anything. I'm sure John Philip Sousa didn't think that, but uh, now we take your meaning. Oh, this is really... I think, you know, this is where the rubber hits the road in Shambhala because everybody comes to these talks and they go, okay, I get the theory of this, now how do we actually enact it in day-to-day -day living? Um, and that's where it becomes very challenging, and that's why we call it the path of the warrior. We don't call it the path of the wimp. Um, and the path of the warrior is we know, we don't even expect, we know things are going to go get messed up and be chaotic and obstreperous. We're ready. We're ready with, and we have certain weapons that we use to deal with it. The one is uh, what we call wind torso, having your energy up. So your confidence and your energy are strong so you don't feel beaten down by life. So that would be one thing. The other is, is the kind of different types of important communication of, that happen within a sacred environment um, in which um, we're able to meet the challenge. You have a new challenge at work there. First of all, the first thing would be to welcome it psychologically to open your mind to it and welcome it and say okay this is going to be interesting so when a warrior is faced with an obstacle or an obstruction or a challenge there's a kind of relishing going on and I've often likened this to um, techs you know techies in the recording studio environment which I work I've been in studios where there's maybe you know 80 musicians on a clock tremendous money going by maybe 10 clients in the control room and the machines start malfunctioning and you call in the tech person and he walks in utterly oblivious to the stress of that and utterly curious about what it is that went wrong and what's going on because that's how he makes his living he or she makes their living so that kind of curiosity about um, you know what um, what could be happening in that situation. And um, I think getting to know that person better is required at this point. There has to be some off the job getting to know you, getting to know all about you quality. That's, I recommend that, you know, take him, out, take him or her out for 
lunch or a beer or something like that and just get to know them as a human being because when we know each other as human beings a whole different level of communication can happen I would recommend that way before trying to fix it uh, allow the situation to become more human and more you know hit, hitting from the soft spot so anyhow but I, I love what you're saying Janet you cracked me up pretty good there so um, Joel says I didn't mean manip manipulation if you remember the thread of what she's saying when she's saying how do you get somebody to and she's saying it's hurtful to be with someone who doesn't see their goodness are you sure that they don't how do you know that I still think that uh, if we allow for a bigger space in which these things we recognize that all beings are working through these equations within their own parameters that we have a different kind of attitude towards seeing challenging circumstances feeling other people's pain and discomfort and leaving a lot of space for them to have uh, to get to it their own way and again modeling the behavior being sympathetic being kind being direct communicative when we need to be um, and having a sense you could say even if their their field is kind of obscured and obstructed and dark even of touching in in a very gentle way continuously gentle way on the fact that you can feel their discomfort and are sympathetic and I, I guess I'm saying let go of the idea of kind of seeing if you could heroically pull them out of it or they could come through they will come through they will in their own time so we can keep talking about that jello but that's I'm that's what I'm feeling here uh, and Karen wrote back on that thread I believe or want to believe that the quality of defenselessness you described does exist in everyone. Now, I wouldn't call it defenselessness, and that also came up over the weekend, um, uh, the Shambhala training. We call it openness. But defenselessness has another implication. It's that somebody's going to then walk all over you, and you're just going to let that happen. That's not what we're talking about here. That quality of, uh, so I'm changing it to open, openness, but we'll say defenseless, defenselessness you described does exist in everyone. I see that as a separate issue from whether or not it can ever be equally cultivated in everyone. Good, good point. Can it be or not? I.e. creating a good society. Um, because I always believe the balance of opposites, darkness and light. But it sounds like you're also saying something similar and saying we're not trying to manipulate anyone's experience. For some reason I'm tuned into this concept in my lifetime so I'm working on myself. Well, all good. Now, again, referring to what happened over the weekend. Uh, Ethan asked this question so okay how many of you people in some way shape or form believe that you have basic goodness or can relate to the idea of it for yourself 90% raise your hand how many of you believe that human society has this quality basic goodness that society is basically good two people raise their hand five people raise their hand out of a hundred and thirty so you're not alone there. Um, and I think the quality that we're talking about is definitely, you're right, if we can't cultivate it ourselves, that has to be the starting point because there's no way, you know, if, if individual people are not processing this and experiencing this, if you lay it on society at that point, you've just misplaced it one further step. But I think one of the things that Sakyong Mipam has been saying lately and it's moved me is that Society is not this monolithic thing, actually. It feels like it is at times, but it's a, it's a additive sum of many, 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 many small exchanges between people. And from that point of view, the kind of, uh, you know, logic would be that once you have two people, you have a society. So if each of them has basic goodness, and now you can work on the space between them and the communication and the cooperation and harmonizing that, you begin to create a uh, foundation of some kind of positive uh, social fabric. It is possible, it's much more challenging, no doubt about it. And very few people take this on. From a spiritual point of view to create a society, 
send me a list of who's tried that. You know, very rare. Usually separation of church and state, right? You, you don't want to mix the metaphors. Sure, everybody's happy and peaceful in church, but those same people go to work and chew each other's legs off during business exchanges. So this is a very deep thing, Karen, you're saying I can really relate to it. And I think it's kind of individual cultivation has to, has to be the starting point. No doubt about it. And then small groups, dyads, <laughs> triads, quadrads. <clears throat> wow, we've got a lot of comments. I'll do my best. We have about another, you know, I'm trying to not go on and on with these things to the point where we all get kind of too bored. But I invite you all to, you know, on Facebook you can just message me and I'll, I'm, or we'll leave this scroll up and you can continue and we can comment and talk to each other. So please feel free to address your, somebody else's comments. As Trungpa Rinpoche used to say, you know, your guess is as good as mine. There's some uh, format in which we're all talking about it. Um, okay, so Judy is saying, in essence, seeing basic goodness in everyone can be challenging, and no doubt about it, it can be challenging. No, but, and that's why it's the path of the warrior, not the path of the um, um, easy, the easy path. It's a hard path. But I agree. <clears throat> and then Judy said, summing it up, uh, I like your comment of gentleness. Perhaps that's one way to apply this teaching on a deeper level. No doubt about it. Uh, the two, you know, powerful dipoles of the Shambhala path are gentleness and fearlessness, both. And gentleness, I would say, is absolutely the icebreaker of the two. If we can experience that softness and gentleness, that soft spot that we talked about, um, the whole rest of it is going to really be on. Trick, you know, um, trick, uh, unstable footing. It's very deep. Being gentle is very deep. Much agreed there. Um, it's third quality. Uh, sometimes we add in is inqu inquisitiveness, actual curiosity about how things uh, are and how they're not, and what's true and what's not true, and if it's true, how is it true? And how does it work? What is gentleness, you know? What does it mean? How do you be that way? What if you don't feel that way? Can you be that way? Even if you don't feel that way right away, can you cultivate it? So those kind of questions are allowed. <clears throat> and uh, Janet saying, thanks, David. Well, you're welcome. And Jello. Thank you, I will put away my Buddha cape. <laughs> well, we're communicating. No superhero, just super space. Yeah. You know, you, we all can take the inspiration we have to help other people and just become more skillful about it. That's what, that's what we're doing. Uh, and Anna is saying, I'm thinking about the eight verses for training the mind, particularly about treating people that mistreat you as precious teachers. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that's in the be grateful to everyone category, right? Um, or or s similar logic there. Be grateful to everyone. Not so easy to do, Anna. Think about it. Not so easy, right? Because we to the extent that we want to have things come out a certain way, we actually can't do that. The people who, who um, are bringing us that which we don't want, you know, the three kinds of suffering, getting that which you don't want and losing that which you do want, and the alternation between those. <clears throat> Once we, um, if somebody gives us what we don't want and we're still grateful to them anyhow, we've kind of unplugged a very powerful little module there. And it's, um, I think, softening is the only way to get there. There's no way to push our insight through, like pushing a uh, thread through a needle and then we get there. So a broken heart is good news from that point of view. 
Rinpoche used to say, chaos is good news. And he actually was not um, messed up by chaos. He was very stable in the middle of it. And uh, some of that has to do with really releasing the outcome and, and just being with the process. <laughs>